Happy Father's Day, y'all. Happy Father's Day. Acknowledging, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Acknowledging, as you did so beautifully in your prayer, Pastor Justin, that this is a mixed day. It probably has just as much uh, pain and sadness associated with it as it does joy and beautiful memories. Um, both and. There I go again. Yep, I know I say it a lot, but uh, the more we practice holding the fullness of life together, um, I think the better we, we become at trusting that God is in all of it, which is kind of what we're talking about today. Uh, Jesus calming the storm, rest in the midst of chaos. Our new summer series is called The Rest of the Story, which I think is pretty clever, a little play on words, but it reminded me, do y'all remember Paul Harvey? Oh, he had this radio show, and it was my dad's favorite morning show to listen to in the car when he was taking us to school. The Rest of the Story, yeah. And so every time I see that, sorry, that was a really bad Paul Harvey <laughs> imitation. No. <laughs> I don't have uh, a Paul Harvey voice, but I remember that so well. And I, I have to admit that both uh, he and Garrison Keillor on the radio probably uh, ingrained in me this love of storytelling. Uh, hearing those stories every day with my dad at the wheel um, changed my heart. So thanks, Paul Harvey. All right, the rest of the story, rest as in... Sabbath, as in holy rest. I was thinking about some of the conventional wisdom about rest and how um, when I was little, my auntie Judy had this embroidered pillow that said, shh, baby sleeping, with little uh, ellipses. And um, she would hang it on the nursery door of my cousin's room when he was taking a nap, when he was a baby. And I hated it because it meant that there was no fun to be had. No running around, no loud toys. It, was, it just sort of should have said, no fun zone. <laughs> Shh, baby sleeping. But that was decades ago. And the thinking on the science of sleep has changed. Now doctors say that in order for a baby to get good sleep, especially in those first few months of life, we need to recreate the womb. That is, make it as womb-like as possible, outside the womb, as we can, to help the baby adjust. But it turns out, yeah, there, are you doing that on purpose? You are. <laughs> Clever. Okay, that's white noise. You hear it? You might think, wait a minute, is that, is that rain? Wait, is it, is it the ocean? It turns out that this is kind of what the womb sounds like. It's a wash with sound. It's a chaotic place. The whooshing of blood vessels and then the gurgling of the mother's digestive tract the beating of the mother's heart and her voice, they all sound louder on the inside than anything we might imagine outside. Because all of the sound, the gurgling, the whirring, the voice, the heartbeat, it reverberates through her bones and her blood vessels and her fluids, and it makes it, they say, louder than a vacuum cleaner in there. 24-7, constantly. That is not what I thought the womb was like. Can you remember? No, probably not. But I have always sort of liked the sound of a vacuum, like in another room, not right next to me. When Matthias was a baby, I remember we would turn on the blow dryer on a cool setting and put him in his swing and just turn it on under. He loved that sound, just the whir of the blow dryer. Lots of noises from outside the womb, it turns out, can also be heard especially in the third trimester. The baby can even recognize the father's voice so that by the time they're born, that is also a comforting and familiar sound. So babies actually find comfort in any sensation 
that reminds them of the womb. We all do, it turns out. So to put them in a quiet space and tiptoe around them is actually, they say, sensory deprivation. And it, it's too quiet. It will be harder for them to fall asleep. Oh, I want to go back in time and tell my Aunt Judy, take that sign down. Let me, let me run around. Let me vacuum. <laughs> that would have been a win-win. So even adults these days will pay top dollar, myself included. Christian and I sleep to rain sounds every night, but you can do cricket noises or ocean sounds. You sleep to a white noise machine, don't you, Justin? Pastor Justin does too. Because it turns out that while we sleep, we're still thinking. Like This makes sense, even though we don't really think about it that much. And that white noise, these different sounds, compete with that thinking and help shut it down. It cancels it out. So for babies, as well as adults, you get a better, deeper sleep if there's a constant white noise in the background because it reminds us all of our origins, the womb. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but anxious thoughts have a way of creeping in just as soon as my head hits the pillow. You know, I can stay busy during the day, task to task, but when I lie down, oh boy, that's when I can get in trouble. That's when our worries find their way into our conscious mind. Sometimes we might even need a little bit of the chaos of the womb to help us find peace in order to hear our mother's heartbeat and to recognize the sound of our father's voice. This is how we find our way to rest. This is how we find our way to peace. All right, with all this new sleep science in mind, let us read now together from the fourth chapter of Mark, verses 35 through 40. It says, On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And waking up, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Be silent. Be still. Then the wind ceased. And there was a dead calm. He said to them, imagine, over the dead calm. Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? The word of God for the people of God, and together we say, thanks be to God. So I think the disciples might have some abandonment issues. It's not like Jesus has jumped ship. He's right there with them. He's in the stern. Okay, he's taking a nap. Like a little baby, he's just asleep. That ship is, is being tossed about. And uh, maybe that's kind of what rocked him into a nice, restful sleep. He was tired. He'd been preaching all day. So they go and they wake him up. Do they think God has no idea what's happening? That, that God doesn't know where Jesus is? But instead of going down and gently awakening him, they assume the worst. They say, do you even care? Do you even care that we are dying up here? Wow, harsh. Perhaps they think that they need to add a little bit of drama to the scene to convey their sense of urgency. So this is the same boat that earlier in the day, at the beginning of chapter 4, Jesus climbs into in order to be heard by the large crowd. Apparently, it's so his voice will carry. Water is like a natural amphitheater. I was joking in first service that we should have church on a boat sometime and give it a try. I've always wanted to try just to see how well 
people can hear. If, if I'm standing on a boat, do I need this thing? I don't know. I've always thought Party Barge Christian Church had a <laughs> ring to it. <laughs> yeah, okay. They like it. Party Barge Christian Church. In Granbury, Texas, I think that would work. Okay, so he's preaching from this boat, and now he's tired. So he tells the disciples, get in, let's go to the other side. And it says that his voice is strong enough to command the wind and the waves. It doesn't really say if, he, if he's loud or not. He just has a command. Must be a pretty powerful voice. So imagine how these words sound to the disciples. As I said, this dead calm after this loud rushing wind and waves crashing over the boat. Why are you afraid? Have you no faith? His words speak to our hearts as well. When we see storm clouds gathering on the horizon. We panic. We look for an immediate solution, some way to fix it, avoid it. We have a very difficult time waiting for God's timing. We cry out to a God who we may think seems to be asleep. We may assume that God is absent and that we are sinking fast. In our confusion, in the midst of chaos, we don't understand. How do we rest in the presence of God's love when we're afraid? That's when we don't know what to do. When we think we've been abandoned. How might we, friends, awaken to Christ within and rest in love? calm the storm. So in 1971, 51 years ago now, a young priest was assigned to be in charge of a youth retreat, this program for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, Ohio. And for most of the very first retreat, he thought these boys were just a bunch of jocks who were tolerating him. These teenagers But as he finished preaching his first sermon, he said amen, and he says he looked up, and he noticed that these young men began to cry and hug one another. He said, I moved back. I didn't didn't know what to do with this. You'd think that I would have been grateful that my sermon had worked. But then they did something I really didn't understand. They started speaking in tongues. These are boys who've never been to church. What is happening? Then they started singing in tongues. I had never heard anyone speak in tongues before. My mouth fell open. What did this mean? I've never heard anything so beautiful and so strange, and no one was orchestrating it. No one he could see. He says, I endured it all for 10 or 15 minutes, and although I was delighting in it, I was also scared. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to join in, so I just watched, and then finally, I said, hey, hey guys, I'm going to go put pizza in the oven next door. Come over in 20 minutes or so. It'll be done. He says, no one paid any attention to me. But I did put those pizzas in the oven. I waited. 20, 25 minutes, none of them came. Something is wrong with teenage boys who don't show up for pizza. So he walks back across the parking lot, and he says, I open those doors. I'll never forget, and now they were all kneeling around the altar of the church, still singing in tongues. Those boys never left the church the whole night. 
This was the birth of the New Jerusalem community. He says the next Friday, many of those boys brought their girlfriends, and soon they were singing in tongues as well. It just grew by word of mouth. And within a month, those kids brought their parents and their grandparents. The young people he taught and led on retreats were overwhelmed. Overwhelmed by love. Chaos. They gathered around this enthusiastic young priest, hungry for scripture, increasingly eager for the shared life that they were learning about. Their weekly prayer meetings began with fervent, charismatic prayer, and they expanded from a group of teenagers to sometimes, he said, more than a thousand people would show up spontaneously, all ages, all backgrounds. This sounds an awful lot like Pentecost, doesn't it? That early church, as Linda so beautifully interpreted for us in our Pentecost uh, pyramids. So he says, as time passed, it eventually became clear that one hour a week of enthusiastic prayer wasn't enough. They were hungry for community all the time. They wanted a closer bond. So the New Jerusalem community came into being, this laboratory church, he calls it, where people still to this day come and commit for weeks at a time to live in this space and pray and study and worship. It wasn't just an idea, it was real. And this community has been going on now. It's still there in Cincinnati, 50 years later. Chaotic beginnings. Fear and trembling. The young people showed the priest how to follow God and to trust that love remains. So chaos holds cosmic possibilities, quite literally. God speaks life over the chaotic waters in the beginning, and all of creation is born. And sometimes it's all we can do just to stay on board. When life's storms hit, it is so hard to trust that there is new life coming from the chaos or to abide in a promise that love remains and that there is a grace that holds the world together when we're being tossed about on the open sea. How do we trust that Jesus is on the boat with us? How do we rest in this promise? Listen to Jesus' words. Be still. Silence. And then we hear the sound of our mother's heartbeat, our father's voice. When people respond in ways that we don't understand, in ways that seem strange or unfamiliar, it's only natural to feel afraid. It's very human. But what might have happened if that young priest had reacted in fear to those boys who were praying so faithfully? What if he had told them that they had to stop? Our story, as followers of Jesus, is just as full of holy terrors as it is holy wonder. None of this can be avoided without also avoiding the rich beauty of life and the truth that Great love and great suffering are our path. There is a very real terror for these disciples. I have to acknowledge, I've been kind of hard on them today, but getting on a boat and just taking off, he doesn't tell them where they're going, really. 
we're going over to the other side. We don't know how this will end. We can't see the other side from here, Jesus. Peace. Be still. So we get on the boat together. We don't have to do this alone, and we weather the storms of life. We stop trying to steer the ship, and we trust that God is going to take us where we need to go. We may not have the safest passage, but we can take hold of an oar and help row. And when we get tired, we can hand it off and rest, let somebody else pitch in for a change. We keep going. We support one another. We work together. And in this, somehow, we're recreating the womb, this place of creative life and growth, chaotic hope, possibility and new life. And together, we make it to the other side. Together with God's help, we navigate difficult waters. New life, new ministry, new hope are all being born in the chaos. Let us rest in this promise. Peace. Be still. Listen for the sound of your mother's heartbeat and your father's voice. Amen.